I'm thinking of what um, Rodolfo was saying earlier this morning about needing new eyes to see. And uh, that, that's absolutely true, and that's very much what um, Einstein was meaning when he said we won't solve present problems with the same thinking that created them. And uh, one, one of the ways that I like to describe the eyes we see with now is, is I, I would call it nation-centric. We, we, we look at the, most of us look at the world through nation-centric glasses. We, we look at the world mainly from the, the perspective of our own nation or from our own uh, culture. And um, what we need to do is to let go of our nation-centric glasses and put on some world-centric glasses. But to do that, I think we need to understand some of the barriers. And in fact, part of the process of putting on world-centric glasses is to understand the barriers that are, are, are standing in our way. And that, that's what I want to talk about. We have all of these many multiple global problems, environmental, economic, uh, political, racism, you name it. Um, there, there are, you know, climate change, there are m multiple, multiple global problems. Um, and at the moment, we, we are just looking at them in different silos. You have many people working on climate, you have people working on economy, you have, you know, we're, we're all working in silos. Um, and that, that is partly because we are uh, still looking through the, through the nation-centric lens. And what, what I want to suggest is that while, while there are all these multiple different global problems, all with different causes, most of them, or very, very many of them, actually share a single barrier. Now, earlier we also talked about how, how can the human community unify around a, an idea or a, you know, because to, to get unity, you have to have some kind of focus. Everyone needs to agree what the problem is. And so I, th this is what I want to talk about, is, is this single barrier to many, many of these problems. And it's what I call destructive global competition. And this is like a vicious circle. Because for any nation to solve almost any of the global problems that face us means that it would have to increase taxes on business or tighten regulations. But any nation that moves first to do that garrots its economy. It makes its economy, its businesses, uncompetitive with those elsewhere. So any nation that moved first would actually suffer a competitive disadvantage, it would suffer jobs and corporations moving production and jobs elsewhere. So there's a, a, there's a, there's a huge disincentive for, for nations to act. And that's why you might get little incremental moves on climate or on other global problems, because you know, a small action is not going to cause a, a significant competitive disadvantage. But we all know that we need, you know, so they, for example, they might cut emissions by 5% or 10%, da, 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 you know. But what we know is we need 60%, 70, 80, you know, we need the really big strides. And that is impossible under the system we have at the moment where we have global capital and corporations which are now disembedded from any particular nation and are now like a, a like I said earlier last yesterday, a cloud that is that is floating up there above the nation state level. And if each of us were, were national governments, you know, we need the rain from that cloud to make our economies grow. And so to get that rain, first of all, we certainly can't act decisively on, on climate change or any of these global problems. In fact, you know what, we've got to do the reverse. We've got to keep our economies internationally competitive, which means often cutting regulations. It means cutting taxes to make our na national economies more attractive to inward investors, to, you know, to the cloud, to, the, to, the, to global corporations and global capital. So, you know, this, this, this I'd like to suggest, you know, when, when we see how very, very many of our problems, whether it's climate change, nuclear weapons, wealth inequality, financial market regulation, tax avoidance, you know, so many of these issues all suffer from this same barrier. 
Now that, on the one hand, that is dreadfully threatening, but on the other, it could be a very good understanding for us to unify around. Because if we, if all the activists from climate and from financial markets and from, you know, from all these different aspects of the global justice movement can start to understand that all of their different issues, or very, very many of them, share the same single barrier, then you've got the basis of a cohesive movement. But there's a, so, so, sorry, yeah, just to finish that off, the, the, the crucial understanding is that it's a vicious circle that governments are caught in. And it's not that governments don't want to solve global problems, it's that they can't. Okay, because they can't move significantly in, in advance of any other government. The nation state system is sort of ossified into this straitjacket, as it were. And so, it, it, you know, that, that has enormous implications because most of the global justice activists think that if we just protest loud enough, if we just, you know, raise awareness enough, the government will be forced to act. No, it bloody well won't. Excuse my French. You know, it's not that they don't want to do it. They can't do it because of the fear of competitive disadvantage. So it's really important to understand this. But there's a, the story gets worse because destructive global competition has a political effect. And it's what I call pseudo-democracy. If you think about it, if every nation, every government of every nation has to keep its national economy internationally competitive and attractive to global capital and, and inward investment, it is forced effectively to, to adopt a very narrow range of effectively neoliberal policies. Okay, policies that keep the country competitive and attractive to inward investment and the, the rain coming from the global capital cloud. And that is why people are getting fed up with politics, because whoever you vote for, you can vote green, red, blue, yellow, or purple, whoever gets into power effectively has to follow that very narrow competitiveness agenda. And that's why we now see people, the, the center becoming, the center of politics, you know, the center right, center left, becoming so discredited in all countries, and voters are moving, are, are, are deserting it, and going to the extremes, whether extreme left or extreme, sorry, I don't know which way we to, or, or, or to the populist right. Now, they may think, you, you know, people may think that a Bernie Sanders or a, or, or a Jeremy Corbyn or a, or a Trump uh, might be able to solve these issues, but they too are caught within the same system, so it's an illusion. Okay, so these are, uh, these are really important, um, to my mind at least, if we're going to find a pathway towards a global, a cooperative global governance, we, we've got to somehow find a way over these barriers of, of destructive global competition and pseudo-democracy. So, those two issues, to my mind, I mean, these are, again, just suggestions, and we can discuss them later, uh, in a minute. Uh, you know, what, what criteria does that, do those issues demand of a, of, of a, of a new global politics that's going to have any chance of success? Well, my first suggestion is that it would have to be citizen-driven, because if, if, we, if we accept that destructive global competition is a reality, and that our politicians, whoever may be in power, is stuck in this sort of neoliberal straitjacket, then it, it, they, can't, they can't get out of the straitjacket. We are going to have to cut them out of it. So citizens are going to have to, you know, the, 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 a new global uh, political movement is going to have to be capable of, of permitting citizens to cut our politicians out of the mess that they've got themselves into. So that's one point. The other, of course, is that the basis of the uh, proposal must overcome vicious circle of global competition, because if it doesn't overcome that, you know, it, 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 it's not going to work anyway. Uh, and there's also a paradox, because and the, the paradox centers around voting, because on the one hand, 
As I've explained, pseudo-democracy means that our votes have become effectively meaningless. Right? And yet, on the other hand, you will not get politicians to move without using the vote in some way. Because protest isn't going to shift them. Avar's petitions is not going to shift them. You know, none, of these, none of these things are going to shift them. You know, it's like, you know, if you want a rabbit to jump, you hold up a carrot. If you want a politician to jump, you've got to hold up a vote. So, you've got, well, even, even votes will, will overcome the money, actually, if you can get enough of them. Um, so, so, on the one hand, our votes have become meaningless, and yet, on the other hand, that's quite liberating. Because now that our votes are meaningless, do you know what? We could actually have a little fun with them, right? And how we would do that is, 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 is another matter. But these are, these are just some of the criteria. I think it would also have to be a proposal that is global, because it would have to overcome destructive global competition. So it has to be global in scope, but it must also accommodate nationalism. And this comes back to what we were talking about yesterday, is that you, I don't think you can have, in the short term, global democracy, because you've got many, many nations who simply aren't democratic, like China. So what you need is some kind of a global agreement whereby you, you use democratic systems to, as part of that process where those democratic systems exist, but where they don't exist, you can just look for the agreement of, of the government. Okay, so an agreement is, is much, a global agreement is a much more flexible concept, if you like, that is more practical and focuses on dealing with the problems in hand rather than basing it on a value like democracy where it, it just isn't a universal value. Yeah, and as I say, it must work for both democratic and non democratic nations. So also, yeah, well, sorry, what I meant also by accommodating nationalism is that it needs to somehow get the message across that global governance would actually be supportive if it's done right. So if you were, were for example, able to raise global taxes like a, a global wealth tax or a, a global currency transactions tax, and you were by agreement able to feed back some of that revenue to poorer countries, to help them build up their own economies and uh, societies, then people wouldn't feel a need to migrate to uh, more, you know, richer countries. And that would safeguard the national and cultural identities, not just of, of, of the USA and, and the Western countries, it would actually build up the cultural national identities of, of developing countries. It would stop the brain drain that, that they suffer from where all their best minds are going to the, to the Western countries where, where salaries are higher and so forth. So they would, people could make a much better living at home. And that's a great uh, uh, argument for people sitting on the right of this political spectrum. For people sitting on the left who, who are worried about um, global uh, equity, uh, wealth inequality, climate change and so forth, you, you know, a global agreements could equally deal with that too. So global, you know, it's a proposal needs to appeal to both uh, right and left, to national sovereign, national cultural identity as well as, you know, the global need as well. So, I mean, those are really just the, I'm suggesting some sort of base criteria that, that any pathway would need to, to, to take into account. Um, I mean, I, I suggest Simpol might be one of those, um, and if you're interested, you, you can uh, take a look at our website or, or at my book. But as I say, there are, there are others, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear, Gary, that there is this meeting. I didn't know that there was this meeting coming up at, at the UN, because I think we, we need to start looking more closely at some of the different proposals that are, that are beginning to come out there now, actually. Uh, I think. I think also, you know, part of, part of the whole idea of getting global governance into people's minds is to have some practical scenarios. Because without those, it, it all, it's all a bit sort of, well, it would be nice, but how do you do it? You know, so, yeah. anyway, there we go.